and we are recording. Great. Welcome, everyone. I hope you've had a, a good week so far getting ready for the spring semester. We had a, a wonderful opportunity to get together for pretty close to a full day session on Monday. And so tonight's session will be, um, we'll, we'll just cover the highlights. So basically, we'll be going through the first hour and a half of what we did on Monday, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some, some question, question and answers, and we can, um, you know, fill you in a little bit on some of the some of the other things we were able to do on Monday when we had some more time. So um, the agenda you see up on the screen um, will be our agenda for um, for tonight as well. Um, I'll go over some announcements, um, general wealth and information for the first 15 minutes. Eric will then um, provide some feedback. Um, he's been analyzed the results from the faculty survey that we did um, for the second year in a row this last fall. Um, Chico was not able to be here tonight, so I will update you on some of the some exciting student services projects that are underway. Um, Stephanie will update us on some things that they've been working on in her group, um, including some great new training opportunities and um, films on demand, which I know has been in demand by a lot of online faculty. Um, one of the things that was really exciting on Monday is that we were able to have five online students join us, and they were a panel for over an hour and a half um, where we were able to ask questions on, you know, from their point of view as students, you know, what helps you succeed in an online class and really touched on a lot of different things from course design to how do you like to have discussions. Um, it was really interesting to hear from those students. And we'll con we're continuing to work on ways to, to get more feedback from students um, via different surveys um, and things like that. Then the groups had a chance to, to meet with the student success team, so I would encourage you to stay in touch with your online chairs throughout the semester, um, and I'm hoping, hopeful that the, the student success teams are a support to you in terms of providing training that's relevant to your discipline and providing just a peer network of others who are teaching online and, and share ideas about what's working well for you, where are you struggling, where could you help. Um, we're really excited about how well that's worked so far. And really the, um, the idea for the student panel came out of one of those student success teams. April's team had decided that they wanted to have a Saturday retreat last fall and they invited a student to come in and, and do sort of a one-person panel and it was so successful that, that was, that's really what inspired that, that portion of the in-service this, this week. Um, in the afternoon, we had some hands-on labs that went into more detail, and Stephanie can share more about workshops related to those topics throughout the semester or how you might find out more. So I wanted to start us off by just going back to our strategic plan and some of those goals that we set a couple of years ago. Um, as you know, our baseline was that 64% of our online students passed meaning they got to see her better, um, compared to 71% on campus. And one of the overall goals of the college is to close that gap. And we have already started making headway there. Um, when we checked at the end of last spring, we had we were able to improve to 68% of current range online students are now passing with a see or better. And you know we're really excited about that, that change. I think a lot of it's due to things like ready to run, um, it's making sure that the course is ready to go and less confusing as students get in there. Um, and I think we're going to continue to improve with some of the improvements to online orientation and having retention specialists and all the, the teamwork um, between the chairs and the faculty and the instructors and the retention specialists on ways we can better reach our students. We're also working on increasing persistence and pass rates across all courses by 5% by 2015. We actually extended that. We're hoping that we can get to 7% um, since we already got, you know, made that 4% last year. And we're also working on trying to increase term to term retention rates. Uh, I think online is a great tool, especially if the economy has gotten better and a lot of students have gotten jobs. Um, one of the things we found is that retention is highest 
for students who are taking a combination of online and classroom courses. And we think it's because it, it helps them continue their education, even though their, their life situations may, may change. So our strategy for getting there, um, you know about the, the staffing that we've been doing of online learning in critical areas. Um, we've been working hard to increase training and communication, and you'll hear about some new initiatives tonight. Um, building the functional team, um, where we've got our instructional team with the chairs. Eric is our new online coach, um, just this last, starting this last year in that capacity. Um, focusing on courses and programs. Stephanie's team focusing on the online learning environment and our student support services staff. And then having the student success team for all three of those groups are really working together to pilot integrated approaches. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are working to establish a culture of continuous improvement. So as we're, you know, every fall, we're gonna ask for reflections and we want to continue to do faculty surveys. We know we're all learning more about how we can do this effectively. And so just wanted to, to share with you that that's our goal and if we're asking for for that kind of feedback it's not because we're not doing a good job now it's that I, you know i really believe that we can all always continuously improve and find better ways to do things and especially as the technology is changing there are always going to be new opportunities new new tools to help our students meet the learning objectives and stay engaged and have some fun along the way so I wanted to give a big thank you um, to many people, and you can see a bunch of different groups, um, as well as all of our instructors and faculty for the time you do spend teaching the classes, as well as participating in these training opportunities, providing your feedback. Um, at the in-service on Monday, I specifically highlighted and had some folks stand up um, from the DevEd team. That's a big initiative, one of the top two for the college as a whole, because we're really redesigning the the DevEd curriculum so that students can get through that sequence more quickly um, with the hope that they can get into college classes faster and thereby um, increase their success rates and completion rates in getting their, their degree. We're moving on to the next step for them. So we have um, Carrie Mitchell has been leading the team on the English side, the new um, CCR coursework and Kathy Mintz in the chair, she's been involved in that. Um, April Lewandowski, Julie Voss, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting people. Um, but there's, there's a team there working on that, that set, um, as well as on the math side, Amanda Ire has been working both on campus and online to redesign those courses. Um, Mary Sokol's been part of that group. Um, lots of different people, I'm sure I'm again leaving people out. Marcus is the lead for that team. But that'll be really important for the college. Um, not only is, think, is work happening on the campuses, um, but since students can take online courses, we want those activities to be available to them online. Let's see, another area I called out specifically was the online writing lab. Um, that's a new service to students that Kathy Mendt had initiated um, along with the writing lab coordinators at each of the campuses. We saw, uh, they saw a need for students to get online feedback, not, not at the tutoring level, but at the writing feedback level um, on an online basis if they couldn't come to campus. And we have had huge response over the last year and found that in fact, um, even more students in campus courses have been taking out that service um, than online, but have had demand through the roof. I think it was close to a thousand um, papers or feedback that was submitted last year. So some other announcements. Um, Kathy Mentz, who I already mentioned, you know, was really a, a leader with the, the online writing lab, has been involved with DevEd, um, and also was one of the key people to initiate the ready to run process and see that through. Um, she is wrapping up her term as the online chair when we first established these positions and Kathy was one of the first group of chairs. It was a three-year term, so she's wrapping that up now and wanted to give some other folks an opportunity. And we did have um, quite a bit of interest in the position, which was great. And I'm really excited to announce that Deb Throgmorton is going to be our new chair starting next year. So she'll be 
um, working with Kathy this semester and over the summer to make that transition. Oh, and I see um, that Kathy has updated us on some more recent statistics um, about the online writing lab. Uh, thank you very much to Kathy for all the work she's done in all those different areas and for planning ahead. And we're just so excited to have Deb Frogmorton on board to continue leading the um, arts, humanities, and communication group. Ready to Run is underway, and you have probably um, been receiving feedback already since we're here at the, the end of In Service Week. Um, that project last, last year, um, that Ready Run team was successfully able to review and provide feedback on all of the online courses that we offered um, before students, before the first day of class. That's been a great project and it's still underway. If you have late start courses, please feel free to you know, continue to submit those. Just try to have them ready uh, you know, a week before the course starts. I've received several requests from the student uh, services team as well as from the online chairs. So just remind everyone to please check your syllabus and make sure that um, dates are updated and that the policies and contact information, some of that stuff that Sometimes we think of it as boilerplate and we forget to go in and, and change those or verify that they're up to date, that they are um, truly updated. Um, we've been noticing during doing course reviews and things like that, that um, we're still seeing KNOVAC's name a lot as the student success coordinator is the person to contact. Um, and of course, we now have the student retention specialist as the contact folks. Um, it's also important to include the name of the online lead and care if that is left out, then students tend to, um, you know, they're really lost as far as who to talk to if they have a question or a concern. And so often they'll start with a campus chair and they end up being bounced around a lot more than necessary. So if you could include that information in there, that would be great. The ready to run team doesn't check the syllabus itself. They're checking the, the course setup and it's really the lead in the chair who are checking your syllabi. Um, the last announcement is that the no-show or the non-attendance reporting date for the regular full-term courses is January 30th, which is next Thursday at 6 p.m. And then faculty have 24 hours after that to report non-attendance. This is just a little reminder that for online courses, attendance means active participation. And you see up on the screen some examples of what that can be um, in discussions. This is kind of a tricky one because a lot of courses will have to say, you know, please introduce yourself to the class. And if it's that general and the student, you know, talks about, you know, I live in Boulder and I love to go hiking on the weekends and those kinds of things, that doesn't address the academic content of the class. So unfortunately, we cannot count that as attendance. So do try and have some discussion questions in there that really get to the content of the class and what do you hope to learn, those kinds of things. Um, quizzes and other assignments also count. The important thing to remember is, is that as long as the student does any of those things, they are in attendance. So that means um, that even if they blew off an assignment in a quiz, which is not good practice, but they did participate in the discussion, um, that they would still be in attendance, somewhat like a student who showed up in your classroom course and sat at the back and may not have had done much, but they were physically there. They just didn't turn in the assignments. You'd still have to count them as present. Um, and that's just so that we can be you know, fair to all students in terms of how it impacts financial aid and all those other kinds of areas. Any questions about non-attendance? Okay, and this is pretty much just a recap of that last slide. Um, one other note that shows up on this one is that the, activ the activity does not need to be graded to count for academic attendance. It just needs to relate to the content of the course. So that is the end of my segment, and I will turn it over to Eric, our instructional coach, so he can share with you what you all had to say at the back of the survey. Well, 
Okay. Is my voice coming through? Loud and clear. Awesome. My headphones aren't working, so I'm winging it with the built-in microphone. I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, in the chat window, I've provided a link to uh, a YouTube video of about 15 or 16 minutes, which goes over the survey. I'm not going to take a full 15 minutes this, this evening. I'm going to try to do this in five or six minutes. I've got a lot to do this afternoon, this evening. Um, but follow the link. It gives a little bit more information. Um, it's really the same PowerPoint, but just more analysis, more of me talking. And if you have other questions about the survey, um, I'm happy to talk to you one on one. You can just email me or if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, I'm also happy to send that to you. So this is the second year, at least the second year that we've done um, this online student success survey where we ask all online instructors and faculty to complete a survey. And since we gave pretty much the identical survey in fall 2012 and fall 2013, we can start to track trends um, you know, from year to year. So I'll do a little bit of showing um, last year's data versus this year's data. Uh, I will note that of the 250 or 260 um, of you who um, had access to the survey, we had 121 people complete the survey, which is a little bit less than 50%. I would really like to get that number higher next year. Um, so I'm not sure which 50% took the survey, but I just want to let you know that's that's what this data is based on. Um, so let's see if I can figure out how to advance my slides. Um, so I'm going to click through these fairly quickly, and I am trying to watch the chat. If someone has a question, I'll stop. But otherwise, you know, at the end, you can ask me to clarify. So full-time, part-time um, breakdown in terms of who took the survey this year. Uh, how many semesters have how many semesters have you been teaching online? And you can see that um, what 65% of the people who took the survey have been teaching online seven or more semesters, and that's 10% higher even than last year. So I think that what that tells us is those people who took the survey, many of us are seasoned instructors, and so um, you know take that into consideration in terms of um, the uh, information provided. Um, a split among the discipline groups with uh, the bulk of the people um, more in math sciences, uh, allied health and psychology, uh, but we had good representation from each of the three groups. Um, in terms of who took the survey, most of you were teaching three credit classes, a few four credit classes, and most people that took the survey were teaching 15 week classes. And I think that's important because as a coach, I've definitely learned over the last um, few semesters that um, the issues that five-week instructors have, for instance, can be quite different. And even um, if instructors are teaching in, in very different disciplines, things that can happen in five-week classes are just simply different maybe than what happens in 10 or 15-week uh, classes. But most of the people taking this survey are uh, people who were teaching 15 weeks. I'm not sure if you can even see this, but this is actually a breakdown of how many people from each discipline area participated in the survey. Um, 18 people from English, 13 math folks, uh, 11 psychology, and the breakdown goes from there. Um, so very interesting. There are a few zeros in there, so maybe next year we can get representation from all of the areas. Um, how many credits are you teaching online this semester? And so lots of people teaching three credits, a um, few people teaching four or more. And the slide um, below that question four, how many credits are you teaching on campus? Again, we've got a diversity there. So lots of us are teaching one class online, one or more classes face-to-face -face, um, to give you a sense of, of who we are. Um, how many days per week do you log in to D2L? 87% um, of us are logging in five days a week. And lots of us are logging in one or even both days on the weekends. And, you know, I'll just throw this out for what it's worth. I think this speaks to our dedication to students. I think it really speaks to what it means to teach an online class and maybe the expectations of students. I will throw in the, the caveat that as uh, a coach, um, I don't want to discourage you from teaching five, six or seven days a week, but I do worry about burnout and people um, working hard, really hard teaching online classes. So, um, again, if you're 
curious about maybe how to not teach seven days a week. If you want to figure out how to take weekends off, um, you can talk to me about that. Um, but, you know, this makes me happy. It just worries me a little bit. Um, this is comparing to 2012 data, and you can see very similar. I mean, we were teaching five to seven days a week last year, and in 2013, also teaching five to seven days per week. Um, we're providing office hours. Pretty much everybody is just offering office hours, general availability by email or by appointment. Um, those of you who teach on campus, Certainly, probably, you know, 30 of you invite your uh, online students to come to your campus office hours. Um, very few people doing WebEx, only four people doing WebEx or other ways of doing uh, office hours. Um, this slide asks, um, how much satisfaction do you get from teaching your online classes? So question 21 there, 38, 38 of you um, scored a five out of five, you know, very satisfied. So, I mean, this tells me we're pretty satisfied teaching online, but if you look at the uh, slide below that, that is for people teaching both online and face-to-face, -face, um, we are more satisfied, significantly more satisfied teaching face-to-face. -face. And again, as a coach, this is something that I would really like to see change over the next few years as we become better at teaching online, and we figure out what we're doing, um, you know, I hope that our satisfaction and the kind of meaning that we derive from teaching online increases. Um, what this tells me is we are working really hard five, six, or seven days a week, and our students are not quite as successful as they are in our face-to-face -face classes, and we're not as satisfied with what we're doing. And so maybe that makes sense. On the other hand, I'm really interested in trying to help people figure out how can we find more meaning and satisfaction in online teaching. It's certainly my belief that when we are happy and thriving as, as faculty, as teachers online, um, you know, that will certain, that will, um, students will realize that and it'll be a better experience for everybody. Um, let's see here. This is just last year's data on the same question and it's very similar. Um, in fact, we are a little bit more satisfied with our online teaching, but it looks like we're um, also more satisfied with um, our face-to-face -face teaching. I'm just trying to read Tammy's uh, chat. Yes, I agree. Um, it may be the case that it's just less stressful to log in uh, seven days a week. So just food for thought. Um, um, so this is, these are questions, these next few slides are questions about how satisfied are you with the amount of online um, the, the training you're getting, uh, training for new and uh, new online instructors and faculty, the amount of training in professional development. Um, I'll just let you eyeball these. I mean, it looks to me like the people who took the survey are uh, fairly satisfied and that they think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, how effective is our current communication with you about these various things, for instance, strategic planning, day-to-day -day processes, professional development, specific issues, et cetera. Um, this is definitely something that the online learning uh, team has been working on. Um, how can we communicate in ways that are effective, to, but not overloading you with emails? You can't see this, but if you um, want to see this slide, it's not a modern art project. There were, if you remember, if you took the survey, you'll remember there, was, there were a few questions that asked you, um, if you can actually zoom in and read this, what do you spend your time doing when you're teaching online? How many hours per week are you spending doing these various things? And the way we ask the question, um, put a whole bunch of things into one question so that the data was a little hard to tease out. But what this really shows is what we're devoting our time to and what we're not doing a lot of online. So you can see um, up here at the top of the screen, this is direct presentation of content. So we're spending you know, quite a few hours, lots of us, um, directly presenting content in terms of lecturing and whatnot, um, making and engaging an online discussion. So lots of us are, are very active in online discussion. Um, this blue area is an NA. So I think next year we'll take that out and the chart will look a little bit better. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but what I'll say is this question I found very interesting because what it tells us is how much time we're devoting in our online classes 
to each of these activities from WebEx to discussions to assessing student learning, providing feedback, uh, et cetera. And what I would really like to be able to do next year, especially if we could get more people from more disciplines to take the survey is provide data on how is what you do when you teach online, how does that compare with what colleagues teaching in similar disciplines or even the same discipline do? Um, I'm not sure we really know what our norms or best practices are. So I will be working on this data more this semester and finding ways to, to you know, give this back to you in a way that might make a little more sense in this chart. Um, this next slide asks the corollary question of what do you ask your online students to do? How much time do you ask them to spend in these various activities in your online class? And so you can see up here, this is reading instructor prepared content, um, watching videos or screencasts. Um, you can see this thing that we're not doing much of is WebEx or Google Hangouts. And pretty much everything down here, we're not doing a lot of working on labs, service learning, students doing presentations, students doing group projects. You know, we're doing a lot of discussion. We're asking students to spend a lot of time in discussion, um, reading from external sources and textbooks. And if you want to see an even more complicated slide, here's where I was trying to match up to see if, you know, we're, if we say we're spending a lot of time, for instance, presenting content, are we expecting students to be spending a similar amount of time reading the content? And if we're not spending much time in WebEx, it probably makes sense that we're not expecting students to spend much time. Um, we're, we're devoting quite a bit of time to discussions, and we can see that most of us are asking students to spend quite a bit of time in discussions. So last word on this for now, um, I, we will definitely be asking this question again, because I think uh, the range in terms of how many hours we were expecting our students to work per week went from a low of, I think, three or four hours per week total. And some people were, you know, if I calculated the total, we're asking their students to spend up to 20 hours a week on one class, which seems a little excessive uh, to me. But um, yeah, and again, it could be just because of the way we ask the question. You know, maybe someone just put two or three hours for each thing, and since there were tons of choices. But I, I hope to be able to dig into this data. It could be definitely could be a five credit class. Um, so um, what I want to do is be able to break this down. It could also be a five week class, which which would do something. Nonetheless, what I hope to be able to do with this and in subsequent surveys is provide more information to you as instructors so you can get a sense of is what I'm doing as an instructor somewhat similar to what other instructors teaching in similar disciplines are doing. And if it's not, maybe you'd want to find out why and ask, some, ask a colleague about it. And what we might find out is there are some norms um, that we're following. So um, thank you very much. Um, you know, we this was a, I think, maybe seemed like an intrusive question. Um, we weren't really trying to get a sense of, you know, how are you using your time so much as um, the Higher Learning Commission is really asking us to talk about what do we do in our online classes? What is online teaching and what do we expect students to do? So I found this information really useful and I'm still playing with how to uh, visualize the data in a way that will make sense to you. I'm going to take about two or three more minutes. Um, the last questions on the survey were really these kind of open-ended questions, and I'm just going to briefly go through some of these. Um, what do online successful online students do that helps them succeed in your online class? Um, I went through and did um, a qualitative analysis and created categories based on the things you said. So I went through all of the answers and I categorized them into various themes. Information is very similar to what we had last year, but I thought I'd pull out a few highlights. Why do students succeed? Because they ask questions and participate in discussions. 51 of the 112 people that took the survey said that. 71 of you said the reason students succeed is they log in often and they keep up with the class, right? And there were lots more things, but those were the, the big the biggies there. Yes, they did. Uh, thanks, uh, Stephanie. Um, these did come up in the student panel. So uh, again, I don't think there was anything in here that blew me out of the water. Um, it's really more confirming what we already know. And to hear the students confirm the same thing, pretty interesting. Why do students struggle? What do you observe or hear directly from students? And the biggie here, 63 of 111 of you said the biggest problem um, with students succeeding in online classes is lack of time management. And it was interesting, uh, our student panelists um, were, were not uh, 
probably a, a, a cross-cut demographic of our students. We had student panelists who were, you know, kind of highly motivated, but they definitely talked about the need to, to manage their time. Um, other things you said, students are too busy, they need face-to-face. -face. There were other things in here, but that was the biggest one. It was time management. I think something that didn't show up on here was just life gets in the way. What are you doing now? That, what are you doing to help students succeed? Um, course pacing, this was bigger than last year. So I think more of us are figuring out that students really need help to figure out what is the best way to pace the course during the week? What should I do when I log in? What should I do on Sunday? What should I do on Monday? What should I do on Tuesday? And so I think more of us are figuring out that students really appreciate um, giving them some advice on how to best manage our course, right? To go through, um, so I thought that was interesting. Early alert, various other things here. What are the most important things that Front Range could do to help students succeed? Um, hang on, uh, to help you succeed as an instructor. Um, we were all over the map here, but people wanted second tier training, um, something beyond the basic training, and that's definitely something that the online learning team is working on. Um, just more professional development. Lots of you thought we were doing a good job. That's always nice to hear, but I definitely like to see all the sorts of things that you really wanted us to be able to do to help you succeed. Um, and I think this is my last slide or close to it. What are the most important things Front Range could do to help our online students be more successful? Um, half of the people who answered this question, right, or just about half, said a student readiness course, that we really need students to be more ready for D2L. And um, again, this was similar to last year, but even a more robust, uh, you know, word from you that this is what we need. And I think that is a few other things, um, making personal connections, um, setting expectations, giving formative feedback, right? Those are things that we want to do. And that is my presentation. So I am going to once more paste in, um, if you want to link to my YouTube, it's really what I just said. I probably went into a little bit more detail, or if you just really want to see this data again, you can click to that YouTube link. Or again, if you just want to get a copy of this PowerPoint, and then you can zoom in on those charts, just send me an email, uh, and I'll be happy to send it to you. And again, thank you very much for everybody who completed the survey this year. Right. Thank you, Eric, for that for that great overview of all the, the faculty and instructor feedback. It's also a good segue into um, some of the information about Chico's and the Student Success Team Initiative. They've also been focusing on that issue that faculty highlighted, which is um, that we really need to focus on student readiness and how do we help students be prepared up front to succeed in our online courses. Um, and so some of the things that the team's been working on um, is that I know if I've heard requests for a very long time to have a required orientation. Um, and we do now have an online orientation for online students. And we do, we're, we still have some technical issues with being able to enforce it. You know, we still, we can't drop someone from a class if they haven't done the orientation. But we do, um, in all of our materials for students on our website, explain that the orientation is required for all new online students. And then it is available, um, you know, they can get in anytime after they register um, to go through and complete the orientation. It was online. Um, and Stephanie, if you want to go ahead and log into the course, uh, that would be great. Do I need to make you the pre presenter? And then I'll just keep talking. <laughs> That would be perfect. Okay, great. So Stephanie will pull that up so you can see what it looks like. Um, we are working on getting instructors access. So if you wanted to go in there and see in more detail on your own, you can do that too. Um, but we're really excited about it. Um, it goes over a bunch of different things from some of the strategies you need to succeed in online courses, as well as some of the basic um, D2L tools and where would you find things. and um, and basic policy information, you know, when do you need to log in, and if you if you signed up late for your course, when do you need to pay, and just a bunch of that really good information. So that course just went live um, last Monday, 
late in the afternoon. And by the next morning, we already had nine students who had taken it. Um, several had completed it. And I think on as of Monday, Chico had said 400, over 400 students had already gone through the online orientation. The average time they're spending is, I think it was just over an hour. And the last update was just under an hour. So that's a lot of time that students are in there you know, actively engaging with that material. So I, I'll be excited to see you know, how that shows up in our numbers down the road on whether that did really help students be successful. The feedback that we've gotten from students, because there's a quick survey tied to the end of that, is that the students found it helpful. And actually, even those who said that they didn't learn anything new still reported that it was, in general, worth their time, which was also good. Students then have continue to have access to that information throughout the semester. So if they just need a refresher, you know, hey, I saw that in the orientation, they can go back and take a look at it. Something else we did, um, again, to try and reach students where they are, is move the face-to-face -face orientations that we used to do at each campus, um, which were fairly well attended several years ago. We've noticed that attendance had been dropping off. And so Chico and his, his team looked at it and replaced those face-to-face -face sessions with live webinars that are now available for students. And as of last week, um, you know, I think at least 100 students were already signed up. I'm sure it's, it's much higher now. Um, but that's also more than we've been seeing the last few years at all of the face-to-face -face orientations combined. So I think it just, you know, it shows the importance of meeting students where they're at, and if they're taking an online course, chances are their best way to access that is through online venues. So we're really excited about those two ways of preparing our students. Um, a couple of other initiatives that we that are already going on. Um, one is that we now have the process automated, so it's happening consistently that within a week of students registering for an online course, they get an email, you know, thanks for registering for the online course with information about those orientation sessions, um, buying books, all that kind of stuff, so that we're catching those students when they're, you know, they're clearly motivated to register for the course. We're hoping to catch them right at that time and help them prepare. We have links to um, the old Ready self-assessment, which is still available to students. Um, that is a really in-depth self-assessment in terms of, you know, do you have the computer skills, the time management skills, um, those kinds of things to succeed online, and it and each student can print out that a really detailed report about where they're at and how they could improve. Um, and then the team has also put together just a five question uh, quick survey online. Um, and Chico showed the link. Um, yep, Stephanie's got it up on the screen. Um, where students can just go through this, and by clicking true or false, it will you know pull up some feedback for them. That's a real, you know, quick, short response because we were finding that a lot of the students who most needed the information in the ready assessment weren't wanting to take uh, the long survey and maybe perhaps be told that they weren't a good match if that really was the only place they had. So this is a quick tool that can still get some of that important information out to them. So any questions about any of those? I just wanted to add quickly, we are working on getting access for all the, the online instructors to this course in a, in a observer capacity. So we, have, we hope to have that in place for you by very early next week. Um, that will allow for you the opportunity to, to get in and take a look at um, all of those wonderful resources that the student, um, student success team has created. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, the other the other thing that, that Chico highlighted that's really important I want to be sure to share with you is um, sort of an update on the, the early alert process um, and how important it is to do that early. Um, Chico had said that, you know, he, he talks with instructors who will say, well, I wanted to give the students a few more days to give them a chance. We wanted to be sure to share that um, the data shows that the earlier students um, the earlier an alert is submitted to students and we can reach out and offer them assistance, the higher the, the pass rates for those students. Um, that, that sometimes, you know, our desire to wait and let them figure it out on their own might be, um, you know, just waiting a little bit too long. So 
Um, he encourages reporting students early. Um, let's see, he said if we take all alerts that came in September 13th or earlier um, last fall, that 23% of those students passed the course. This is, you know, recognizing these are students where instructors already saw that, you know, they were they were concerned about the student, but 23% did pass the course. Of those reported after September 13th, only 7% of those students were able to successfully complete the course. So the, the earlier you can um, get those early alerts in, the, the better in terms of the getting being able to get students on the right track as well as possible. Tammy, should we remind folks how they get to that information? I think that would be a great idea. Um, last semester, there was um, a small issue with the form in terms of submitting it. Um, so I think if you do run into any issues with, with the form, I want to be sure to let you know to email Chico or email the retention specialist and they will, um, you know, they'll follow up right away. That link located in eWolf before I log into here? It was located in eWolf. See if I can find it. But I know, it, and it wasn't just online, I know there were glitches last for, you know, across the campuses to last spring, which is why they went to just emailing the retention specialist directly. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I actually, Chico and I were talking about this link today, so if you would like me to help you, um, I, I, can, I can dig into D2L and grab a, 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 the, the link. Hold on, let's see if I can actually log in. Hey, I think that's like a fifth time is a charm. And then, so, is it under faculty, Kristen? It is under faculty. And then scroll down on that left bar, uh, faculty course tools, the bottom link there. And they're going to update this so that it will have a form. It just currently does not. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Chico also mentioned that, that his team will send out an email probably the Monday, not next week, but the following week. So after students have had a, about a week in class, they'll send out an email to everyone about the alert, early alert process, just to remind you. At that point, you might be able to, you might see, start seeing some patterns. Okay. Any questions about any of those things or other student services initiatives? Okay, well then with that, let me turn it over to Stephanie to talk about some of the training opportunities and other resources we have coming up. Okay, thank you, Tammy. So we should be back at the main WebEx interface. All right, let me find my presentation. There we go. Um, I briefly wanted to just remind our group here this evening that the instructional design team has a, a wide variety of support options available for you. And we can support you in, in any of the areas that you see listed on the screen. So everything from instructional design to student engagement to desire to learn, general support, um, we're here to, to help you accomplish the types of things that you want to accomplish in your classes. Um, in the area of instructional design, we've got four instructional designers who work on our team. And our instructional designers um, love talking about teaching and learning. They love talking with instructors about how to set up their class so that it's easier for students to navigate or it's more consistent for students to find out what they're looking for. Um, we would love for you to contact us to say, you know, I'm trying to meet these kind of learning goals in my class and I'm just kind of at a loss for how to do that um, in a way that's going to work for me and for my students. So please feel free to contact any of the instructional designers if, if those are areas that you would like to work on for your course for the upcoming semester. 
Um, Bill Tankovich is our Educational Technology Coordinator, and Bill is able to help you with all things technology and media related. So if you ever find yourself thinking, I saw this really cool thing in so-and-so's class, and I would love to figure out how they did it and see if I might be able to incorporate something like that in my class, Bill is the guy that you want to contact. Um, he loves to get in and play around with new technology tools. Um, he's also available to help you with assistance in de designing and developing any kind of media-based projects. So if you're thinking, hmm, you know, I would like to be able to create some kind of pen casts or videos for my class that cover a certain type of concept, Bill would love to talk with you and give you some assistance as you get set up with your ideas and figure out how to carry them out. John Heisel is our faculty development coordinator, and John is responsible for putting together all of our training opportunities for faculty and instructors. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to share um, where you can find our spring 2014 training calendar. But if you're thinking of a type of training that you don't see us offering, that would be really helpful for you. Um, you have an idea for second tier training. I would like to receive training on X, Y, or Z please reach out to John and he would be happy to dig more into that with you and figure out how we can get you the professional development that you are seeking. We are also happy to do training for um, discipline areas and our different student success teams. So if that's something that interests you, please contact John as well. Kristen Rivetal is our learning management systems coordinator, and she is um, she knows all things about D2L. Um, Kristen was responsible for the success of our upgrade to Desire to Learn 10.2 that we just completed. And Kristen is available to help you with all things inside of the learning management system. Um, if you're looking to upload a publisher EPAC or you want to work with a test bank that might come with your text, that is something that she can help you with. Um, she works to create our cross-listed courses, um, as well as do enrollment, supervisory enrollment and enrollment management in courses. Um, within the next couple of months, Kristen is going to be turning her focus to explore a little bit about exploration of mobile access for our users. Um, so keep your ears tuned to a little bit more information about what that might mean later on in the semester. Kay Novak is our instructional designer of student engagement, and Kay is the person that you would want to contact if you are interested in engaging students in your course content by use of social media, virtual learning environments, or immersive learning. Um, Kay would be your contact if you want to do things like incorporate the idea of badging into your online courses, or if you're just interested to learn a little bit more about gaming in the educational environment. Okay, and last but certainly not least, um, all of the members of our team are available to help you with Desire to Learn technical support. Uh, Brandon Pouillot and George Hines staff are um, instructional design centers at Larimer Campus and at Westminster, and they can really help you with any kind of D2L question that you come across. Um, so if you come across something that kind of has you stumped, um, and instead of sitting there and scratching your head for an hour and trying to figure out why is this not doing what I think it should do? Please feel free to contact them or any of the members of our team, and we can help you work through um, answering whatever kinds of questions um, that you're having about the learning system, or even questions that maybe students are posing to you that um, you're not quite sure how to answer. So I'm going to take a, a break here and just monitor the chat. Is there any questions? See a question from Fran Moran. Fran, you're asking if the video concerning discussion in D2L will be updated soon. Can you be more specific? Do you mean for faculty or for students? Okay, Fran, I will keep an eye on the chat. Um, if there are no other questions about the, oh, there's Fran for students. I use it in my course. 
Fran, we're going to have to check into you for that. The uh, student retention specialist team works on all of the student videos, so I'll make a note to touch base with Chico about that tomorrow and get back to you on that. Okay, I want to um, finish up my my small portion this evening with just telling you about two of the initiatives that we've been working with that I'm excited to share with you. So I'm going to share my web browser, so give me a second. Okay, um, the first thing that I wanted to share with you is we've been working hard to plan an entire semester of training with opportunities to engage our online instructors, um, our campus-based instructors, and also provide some um, more in-depth second-tier trainings that so many of you have asked about. Eric identified a little bit of that in the survey. Um, we sent out an email late last week with um, a link to that training calendar, but John Heisel wanted me to make sure that you all knew how to access that through the website um, as well. And so you can find the link to our training calendar by going to frontrange.edu, hovering over faculty and staff, and clicking on Logins. Um, from here, you can click Teaching Online, and that's going to bring you to the online learning webpage. And under Learn New Things is where you'll find information about our training. And if you click on Training Calendar, it's going to go ahead and open up a PDF of all of the training opportunities that we have available. Um, for the month of January and the beginning of February, we're, we're really focused on the basics of getting folks up and running with Desire to Learn. But you'll notice as you go through the um, training schedule, and I'm not going to go through all of the months through May, but you'll notice that we're offering, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of opportunities that are new for us, and we're really quite excited to get out there and do some training outside of Desire to Learn basics. Um, for example, um, in the chat a little while ago, um, I was talking about WebEx, and there's a WebEx, um, a WebEx training session coming up. Maybe that is at the beginning of March. I thought that was a little bit earlier, but we're covering everything from WebEx to using assessments better in D2L to thinking about looking for open educational resources and creative commons to how do I use Google Hangout with my students. So I encourage you to go ahead and check out our training calendar. We do ask that you register for um, register for our training sessions so that we know you're coming. Um, for all of our sessions, we have tried to work in also offering a WebEx webinar um, so that our folks that can't make it to campus can come and join us for those webinars. Um, and we're also planning on recording all of those sessions and making them available in the faculty learning community for folks. So that's one highlight that I wanted to give you an update on. Uh, the last highlight that I want to go ahead and give you an update on is Films on Demand. Tammy mentioned Films on Demand at the beginning of the in-service, and Films on Demand is a digital education video resource. Films on Demand has access to over 14,000 video titles in a variety of different discipline areas. Um, they have collections ranging from anthropology to biology to history to education, um, so forth and so on. Many of you have been um, asking for access to Films on Demand for the last couple of months, and we've been working really hard with the vendor and through our college processes um, to get you access to Films on Demand for use in your online courses. I'm happy to announce that we are very close with getting our contract finalized with the vendor and through Front Range, and we hope to be able to have access available in a paid capacity sometime next week. With that in mind, we do have access currently to a trial version where you can go in and um, function just as you will when we have our, our paid subscription active and enabled um, to go ahead and create your own account and create playlists for use in your classes. Um, we spent the afternoon of the face-to-face -face in service on Monday offering some training sessions for folks on how you go in and, and log into our account and create your own account within the Front Range Online Learning. 
and start creating playlists. Um, Bill Tankovich, our educational technology coordinator, is working on pulling together some directions and screencasts that we can send out to all of you folks so that you can get in there and start accessing that information as soon as possible. And we will be sending that information out to folks very early next week. So I just wanted to share with you that we're, we're very close to, to having this added to our list of resources that we have available to us um, through online learning at Front Range Community College. And April said it's excited I can uh, renovate some of my courses with some video clips. I think that um, you'll find that there is just a, a wide variety of topics to choose from. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about Films on Demand is everything is ADA compliant and accessible, meaning that everything has both captions and transcripts that accompany the videos. Uh, another neat feature of Films on Demand, if, uh, if it's a longer video that I find that I, I like the video, but I only want to show 15 minutes of the 45-minute video, I can go ahead and clip out just that 15-minute segment and post that for my students to watch. So lots of really great things available. Again, we're working on some directions for that, and we'll send those out very early next week um, so that you can get in and, and have access to our account. Um, but more importantly, um, you have some direction on exactly how to set things up um, once you're in Films on Demand for your online courses. Um, if you're just burning to get in there and see what's available, you can go ahead and um, go to um, filmsondemand.com. Um, that's going to go ahead and bring you to a similar page that we're at here, and you can look at um, samples of the video clips that they have available. And that is it for updates from the Instructional Design and Educational Technology team. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. So we have about half an hour left. Um, we found that in the past, an hour just wasn't quite enough. So we wanted to be sure to have time for there is an extra information. Um, the rest of the in-service on Monday was we segued from that. We had a break after this sort of overview presentation and we had the student panel. So I was wondering for, for folks who were there on Monday and got to hear the student panel, what was what was one of the biggest takeaways you got from that that presentation? I'll jump in if you don't mind. Um, I was going to type this, but one of the things that the students seem to really agree on is um, discussion. Discussions can be very confusing to students, and we can send mis mixed messages about what we want out of discussions. These were five really motivated students, and they talked a lot about you know the trouble when we ask for very complex discussion uh, answers to discussion questions. You know. Uh, answer this question that has five parts and then uh, log back in and respond to two of your classmates. And so these were motivated students. They were logged in, logging in, making their discussion posts, and then really struggling, waiting for other students to respond and, and trying to, you know, figure out how can I type 400 words when I've already said. So they weren't really saying they didn't like discussion. They were, I think they were really asking us to think really carefully about why we're offering discussion questions or topics what our goal is, what we want out of them, and to really give guidance in terms of, um, you know, how they can succeed in discussions. Um, so I thought that was interesting. One of the things that I thought was really interesting um, from the panel on Monday is that students expressed in a couple of different types of questions how they really wanted to know what was expected of them. So I, I think one of the examples was, you know, they wanted to know at the beginning of the semester, you know, what, what types of assignments are we going to be expected to do in this class? And when are those assignments going to be available so that I can start working on them? Um, when are they going to be due? Um, they stressed about how it can be stressful for them when they don't know all that information or that information changes and it might display one way in the assignment and another way in the, the course schedule that that is confusing for them and it takes a lot of time for them to kind of wade through and figure out okay this is this is really what I'm expected to do or this is really when this is due and 
that that time is taking away from their learning a little bit. And we did spend quite a bit of time, um, as students did, talking about, um, you know, like using, you know, posting a schedule was really important to them. And, you know, should it be in the calendar tool or different places? And I think the students had different perspectives on that. But a common thread was that which whichever one you pick um, to explain up front, you know, how you're going to be doing in the class and then to be consistent about keeping that place updated. I wanted to. Um, can you hear me? I'm having, I think I'm having some trouble with my mic. Yes, I can hear you, Kathy. Okay. So one of the things that we heard in um, during lunch, one of the students came in and we asked her, what is um, the single most important thing in terms of connecting with your instructor? And she said that it was seeing the instructor in the discussions, responding and being a part of the discussion every week. And then another, um, let's see, what was the other thing I was thinking of? Oh, it was just what Tammy said, I guess, it was that I also heard very clearly that students really want to schedule and they want those dates on it. And if there are any updates, they need to know that. Another, um... Another thing that a student said about a class, and I can't remember the exact question that was being asked for this, but I, I think it was talking about, you know, what, what did it feel like when you logged into your online class for the first time or something like that? And the student was talking about how right when she logged in on the first day of class when it was available, there was a news item from the instructor and it was a video of the instructor and the it was a little bit silly and it was lighthearted in its nature, but it really allowed for the student to see that, wow, this, this person teaching my class, they're a real person and they have a personality and they're kind of funny and they're giving me a tour around the class and all the things that are important for me to to know and succeed, and that really helped her build a, a connection with the instructor and, and be really quite engaged with the class because she felt like the instructor was engaged with the class by just creating that video and putting herself out there to meet students. Students also had positive feedback um, for those who'd, who'd had instructors post audio feedback on papers or other assignments, that they, they did also appreciate that a lot, getting to hear the tone of voice. Oh, that's a good point, Eric. A lot of the students on the panel commented about how much they print and that they print a lot of items in the class, which I found to be um, quite interesting. Sometimes we think about, well, is it better to have the entire syllabus in one document? Or is it better to chunk it into pieces so that it is more readable for students on the screen? And I did find it interesting that students are printing quite a bit still. In terms of feedback and the audio especially, um, it was interesting because a student remarked on how uh, how a teacher had gone to taken so much time and um, taken the trouble to do audio feedback, recording feedback for them on their work instead of writing it. And that's something that's borne out in research about audio feedback, that students often feel like the teacher is spending more time looking at their work, even though audio feedback lots of times takes less time than written feedback. So it's always interesting to hear that kind of a comment. And um, I do think that the audio feedback really does get you, the instructor, into the um, into the class and lets the student know that you that you do have a relationship with them and that you are really interested in helping them to learn in the class. Amazing and just that kind of stuff. Uh, can you hear me? Am I coming through or not? Hi, Fran. We can hear you. Hi. 
Hi, um, I'm going to want to jump back to that uh, when we were talking about time management in the calendar. Um, DQL used to have the ability for the student to be able to go in and use the calendar and put information and uh, into the calendar. And now that's stopped and all they have are the lists. Um, I teach it in that uh, AAA course, and the students are finding they have to go with the ITEL. A number of you, uh, Stephanie, you gave me that video. Quite a few students have been going into that and using it to be able to coordinate their calendars with what's in D2L. But a lot of them don't have that access and really would like to be able to actually get into the calendar and put things in instead of having to keep one outside of of the program. Are they thinking at all about starting that again, or is that just a dead issue? Fran, this is Kristen, um, and I probably we need to address this offline because I think that there there is a calendar and students can add events to it. Um, so perhaps it's just a, a misunderstanding of the interface. but. Um, Rather than, than take up meeting time right now, um, let me catch up with you probably tomorrow. I'll send you an email. That's perfect. I'd love to work through it with you. Yep, some, some threads of takeaways that we got from the students um, that we'll continue to follow up on and be discussing with chairs and leads and faculty moving forward is, you know, are there ways that we can, are there things that could be consistent between classes that would help students, you know, that we don't already have consistent, um, that we might want to agree upon as as faculty and instructors, um, just to help remove some of that noise, and then, you know, what things shouldn't be. Um, you know, I think there's some more we can do there. It would also help us in terms of being able to do orientation. Um, as when students go into the online orientation now, you know, they see the basic set up, set up if we had more of a more consistency between individual courses, we could even go into more detail about this is where you find the syllabus and this is where you find you know this information. Um, but again, there are so many different ways to do things that I think that'll require a lot of discussion to see what makes sense and what's the right balance of the, the personality that making those individual choices can have and the, the benefits of consistency across courses. Something else we're um, doing a lot of work on right now um, and we'll be doing moving forward is we can see what a difference audio um, and video make to our students. It gives you that sense of you know live connection with with your fellow students and your instructor. Um, but we're also hearing more about um, accessibility legislation. Um, and so we want to be sure that um, as we're preparing those things that they're, they're as accessible as possible. So we're doing some research on that and the system's looking at that. And so just know that that conversation's happening and we'll be continuing to do that. Um, we are glad that, you know, one of the reasons D2L was selected as our learning management system is that it is, as far as the tool itself, one of the most accessible. And we just have more work to do in terms of you know, how we, making sure we prepare our handouts and have training that the content that we put into DTL is also accessible. I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Good. This is Ray Warren. And um, I had a uh, request last semester, actually in both classes that I teach, the, the students were kind of spread all over the front range, but they wanted to get together. And I think some of them actually did do with the study. And uh, what I offered up was, uh, I said, well, maybe we can do a virtual study group. Um, I'll just open a, uh, a discussion group and you can just have at it. Um, it worked for a week and then it fizzled out. Um, I was wondering if this Google Hangout is uh, something that would work for that kind of thing. Stephanie, do you want to talk to that since you have more experience? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I I think what Ray is kind of pointing out is that difference between the the synchronous communication of we're all we're all you know talking about the same thing at the same time versus that 
asynchronous communication of somebody posts on the study board and then maybe they have to wait for a little while for somebody to get back to them. Um, Google Hangout would be a tool that would allow for students to go ahead and um, set up an area where they could um, function much like we're functioning in WebEx um, right now um, in terms of having the ability to see each other via webcam, to talk to each other, to talk to each other synchronously, to be able to go ahead and um, share documents and, and screens and those types of things. Um, as an instructor, you have access to our WebEx product and, and you could use WebEx to set up any kind of study sessions or office hours that you would be facilitating. But I do not believe that students have access to do that via WebEx. Um, it's just a, a staff and employee tool at this point in time. So um, Google Hangout would be an, an excellent alternative to that. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Google Hangout, Kay Novak, um, who is our instructional designer of student engagement, uses Google Hangout quite a bit for the games MOOC that, for the games MOOC sessions that she conducts. So if you're interested in learning more about Google Hangout or you want to see if she can help you put together um, some best practices or tips for your students, please feel free to contact Kay. Hi, this is John Wilkins. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I just wanted to make uh, a comment regarding uh, student feedback. Uh, last semester, I taught an online course in archaeology, and um, I became very excited about um, using WebEx. As Stephanie and Eric know about this, I've been having uh, you know, conversations with them and getting some advice for them. I ended up having about three three two-hour WebEx sessions a week uh, for the class. Um, there were some WebEx sessions that were open-ended. Others um, were uh, more structured in terms of exam review and uh, discussion of various topics in the chapters that are being covered in the textbook. And um, over the course of the whole semester, I had only two students out of 12 who even came on to any of the WebEx sessions. So I'm talking about anywhere from uh, from six to eight hours of open WebEx sessions where I just sat and waited for the students to come on. Uh, I had reading material. I could keep myself busy. And uh, so only two out of 12 students came on the whole semester. And the reason why um, I use that example is that uh, I'm afraid sometimes that we tend to overreact a little bit to some of the feedback that we get from students, uh, not to diminish the interest that students would have um, in the courses, but you know, quite honestly, there are a lot of students who are taking online courses who are simply not interested in communicating uh, with the teacher or the instructor. And uh, I just think it's important for us to kind of keep that in perspective that we can try as hard as we can to do things to get students interested in our course, but in a lot of cases, it's just not going to work. I think John brings up an, an extra, an interesting point about when we're working, especially with maybe a piece of technology in our class that we're helping to help us meet some kind of learning goals that we're setting for students that there can, there can be challenges and, and how that might work. Um, are students going to be interested? Are they going to show up? Am I going to just be hanging out here? Um, on my own all semester during these, these sessions that I set up with no students. And, you know, part of me thinks, oh, man, you know, I just want them to, I want the students to show up and, and be engaged in that particular manner. And the other part of me as an instructional designer, and, and John knows this, um, makes me want to think, okay, how can we get students more excited and more engaged about maybe wanting to take advantage of some of these tools and these these items that we set up for them. And I was just thinking off the top of my head here, we had the student on the panel who was really impacted by the video introduction from her instructor and it really helped her feel like she belonged in the class and like um, she wanted to be really engaged with the material. And I'm wondering if you know, maybe to get students interested in a tool like WebEx that 
having it be the first time you use a tool like that with a student is very low stakes and maybe doing and setting up a, I would really like to get a chance to, to know who you are students in my class and doing a introduction session where they can ask you questions and you can ask them questions might be something that's successful. You know, I, as John said, you just never know what is going to work, but that that's an idea that I just thought of while we were why we were talking and thinking about the student panel. Uh, this is Ray Warren again. Can I say something on that topic? Please. This is ever moderating. Um, yeah, I, I can see why that wouldn't work. And I found in my classes that oftentimes the people just do not have the time. And the reason they're doing an online class, they do not have the time to attend a, uh, a formal class at a, a specific time. Um, so, you know, why would they be able to attend um, a lecture even if it's virtual like this, you know, if they can't uh, get to a class? So, um, based on that, I wouldn't be, I, I have used WebEx, and, but I've used it on a one-on-one -on -one basis and when they wanted to talk. So, and it's been very effective and I do like that, but I never opened it up to any more than one person at a time. Back to you. I think experimenting from, with um, with different methods is really good. Um, you know, in some ways, it's I think the same phenomenon you see in a classroom course where you say, you know, I have office hours. This is where I'm at every week, but you don't necessarily have that many students actually take advantage of those office hours. Um, so part of it is I think it's an important um, service to provide, and I think it makes a difference to students to know you're available, even if they never actually take advantage of that time to come and see you. Um, so finding ways like, which it sounds like um, the person who originally spoke was already doing, you know, you can have open office hours so you're there and students know that you're there and can talk with them live during a specific period of time when, you know, you're doing other stuff, you're prepping the class, you're grading assignments, those kinds of things. So you're not, you're not wasting your time that you're being available for them. And then, you know, I, I look forward to hearing more about different ways instructors are using the live vehicle for study sessions and, and things like that. We also have the challenge of, you know, as, as folks have mentioned, you know, students take online courses because of scheduling issues. Um, you know, do we need to record those sessions for folks who weren't able to attend or how do we do it? Or maybe even have, you could think about having groups of students identify times when they're available and at work or group them according to the times that they're available. I think there are a lot of different different possibilities to explore. So what I would say on this topic, if if you're, you know, if you want to talk more about this, if you're curious about what are the types of things that I that I could try, um, any of the instructional designers would love for you to contact them and talk about this. I know that Eric, as your instructional coach, um, would love to talk about this as, as part of coaching. Um, we hear a lot from students that, well, I don't really think online's for me because I, I, I kind of feel isolated and working to figure out how we can make students feel less I isolated, I think is, is definitely a, a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that if we think about what our course content is and, and what it, you know, what we really want students to get out of it, I'm pretty confident that that we can find a way to connect and engage with students in a manner um, that is going to allow for them to kind of shift that feeling a little bit. And maybe it's not WebEx. Maybe it's something else completely. Maybe it's voice discussions instead of text-based discussions. But I'm pretty confident that we can use some of these tools to help aid us in and moving online teaching and learning forward, um, just like we've all expressed wanting to do. One, one clarification I should provide putting my administrator hat on is that right now at Front Range, we, we tell students that our, you know, you can take our online courses any, any place, any time, um, you know, granted within, with some specific deadlines that they have flexibility in terms of when they do the homework as long as they meet the deadline and those kinds of things. So um, if you are going to, to experiment with having required sessions, I do think at this point it's important to provide an alternative for students who, 
who could, just couldn't come to that required session, if that makes sense. Um, I do think there's potential, as Kathy had mentioned, for you know a hybrid online course where we you know are able to tell students up front, you know, there are specific synchronous time schedules when you have to be there, and then the rest is on your own time. So just something to think about. So does anyone have any any other questions or things that we need to, to touch on in the last five minutes here? Okay, well, thank you everyone for participating. Um, feel free to contact any of us if you have questions and have a great semester. Thank you, everybody. Have a great semester. I am going to go ahead and stop our recording for the evening.